Hi everyone and welcome to today's Geoscience Online Learning Initiative webinar course titled Unconscious Bias Perspectives from the Private Sector. I'm Delaney Robinson and I will be moderating today's webinar with Christopher Keen and Leela Gonzalez who are also joining us from AGI. In today's course, we'll be hearing from Kelly Greaser as she provides an in-depth look at unconscious biases at work and what we can do to control and counteract our biases. This webinar will cover some of the ways our brains demonstrate these biases so we can better understand and recognize them. We will invite participants to discuss ways they can overcome situations where they observe or feel bias. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Kelly Greaser, who is a senior associate hydrogeologist at Santec with more than 20 years of experience in hydrogeology, geochemistry, and geology in the mining industry and industrial contamination sites. Her experience includes work in hydrogeologic and geochemical characterizations, water resources, mine dewatering, reclamation, and closure. Kelly is also an advocate for women in the industry and is excited to share her observations on the work of Howard Ross. With that, I'll turn the slides over to Kelly. Great, thanks Delaney. Okay, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, like Delaney said, uh, today I wanna to talk about unco unconscious bias. Um, and today we're, we're gonna talk about uh, understanding why we all are biased. I mean, we all really are biased and, and understanding why is the first step to trying to, to counteract that. Um, we'll talk about how, how bias can affect us um, in the workplace and then how we can learn about our biases. And then most importantly, what do we do to counteract our biases and how do we counteract bias with other people? Um, like Delaney said, a lot of this information comes from Howard Ross and he's a business consultant with over 30 years experience in leadership, diversity, inclusion, and organizational transformation. And at the bottom of this slide, I've included a lot of links to um, you know, resources on the internet, um, some webinars and lectures that he's given. Um, at the bottom is, is the, the, uh, the web link to his website. He's actually written three books. I mean, there's a lot of information out there on unconscious bias. Um, Howard Ross is just um, someone that I, that I found really, I connected with and I understood how he explained bias. So, so I've really gravitated towards, um, you know, his perspectives. So uh, Ross says bias is simply a tendency or inclination that results in judgment about a question. It's not negative or, or positive. Um, and he explains bias is really a component of survival and it's part of human nature. We really all are truly biased. Um, and he explains it by, or he, you know, he explains it by, by separating the brain into two segments, the fast or the emotional and the unconscious part of the brain and the slow thinking conscious part of the brain. And it's the fight between these two portions of the brain um, that, that we really are in every day. And that the fast emotional unconscious part usually a lot of times dominates. Um, and that's where bias is derived. So the fast brain makes quick and effective decisions rather than sticking to facts at all times. I mean, the fast brain is just, that's, that's the way it works. And it, and it just sticks with what you know. Our, our brains act fast rather than rationally. Um, the fast brain dominates unless you take the time to actually engage the slow brain. And bias actually derives from the fight, flight, freeze impulse in our brain. You know, back when, you know, pre-industrial age, we literally had to fight and hunt for our food, um, you know, for our survival. That's where bias comes, comes from. Our fast brain actually processes 200,000 times more information than our slow conscious brain. So our fast brain is what's going through all of that information and trying to filter out what's important. Bias is actually derived from the fast brain. Um, that's the unconscious side of the, of the brain. And our fast brain really does help us survive. It looks for danger. Bias is what allows us to live our lives freely rather than be plagued with caution and suspicious of everything, every situation, every person. Um, Ross gave an example of walking across a floor on some big high rise. You know, all of us would expect that the floor is going to prevent us from falling, you know, uh, several floors to our death or to our death. But if you've had a previous experience where, um, you know, maybe a floor failed and, you know, you, you got injured, um, then maybe you would suspect that floor. But otherwise, there's, there's all this information in the world and our fast brain tells us what's safe and what's not safe. So, and if the, if the brain misses a reward, 
it's a it's a nice pleasant surprise but if the brain misses danger then maybe it means you're dead so our fast brain is really designed to to pull in all this information very quickly and process it and and keep us safe if literally if we relied on our slow brain all the time we get in a traffic accident every day our slow brain cannot process all that information quickly enough for us to make decisions and literally go through go through our lives now so our fast brain works fast enough to keep us safe. It's critical to our survival. And because of this, because of the, the, the fast brain working, you know, literally so quickly, we think we're rational, but in reality, our fast, our fast brain is making us be rationalizing. You know, we may be in a situation and we think we're making clear decisions, but in reality, you know, we're rationalizing a situation and, and, and maybe might not making a decision we would make otherwise with our slow brain. Um, and Ross states that given any human characteristic, he can show that we can be biased. Um, so this really tells you that that fast brain is dominating um, a lot of the time. And, and he explains that our backgrounds create a filter through which we see the world. And because everyone's background is different, everyone's filter is different. And so everyone's biases are different. So again, the first step is understanding what our biases are so that then we can, then we can take steps to counteract them. So we've all, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the statistics, you know, bias can affect progression in the workplace. You know, we've heard the statistics about lack of diversity, especially when it comes to, you know, women and, and people of, of different races in, you know, the, the, the high positions in business in the U.S. So I'm not going to bore you with those statistics. Um, but one statistic that I found really surprising is about tall men. 15% of the men in the U.S. are over six feet tall, but 60% of CEOs in the U.S. are men over six feet tall. Less than 4% of men are six foot two in the U.S., but 36% of CEOs in the U.S. are men over six feet tall, six, six foot two. The question is why? Well, again, back when we had to fight for our survival, tall people were typically more capable. You know, they could hunt, and fight for food, they could protect their families, they could protect their, their dwellings, their home, their areas, um, they could provide for their family better. Tall people were more capable. And, and again, that's that fast brain looking, looking for danger, trying to keep us, uh, keep us alive. And now in today's world, being more capable doesn't necessarily translate into being smarter, but it demonstrates that our fast brains a lot of time take over and we see a tall person and we think, you know, we translate capable to smart and we think that they're smarter and, and more capable in the business world, even though it, it may not necessarily translate. And these statistics show that. I mean, we're talking about all men. This isn't gender. It's not race. It's it's, you know, not any of those other things. It's just how tall you are. So here's a here's a graphic, the four layers of diversity by um, Garden Schwartz and Rowe, and it, and it shows these four different layers. I mean, you can see just a, a, a number of um, of different aspects um, here over on the, the left side is appearance. You know, that's you know, that's where tall fits into things. Um, recreational habits, personal habits, marital status, parental status, you know, the, 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 the type of home that you were raised in. All of these different aspects of human characteristics, we can be biased about. And, and this may influence our behavior in the workplace. So it's important to, to understand that. And really this shows it's bias is much more than simply, you know, gender, class, race, or religion. I mean, it's every aspect of human characteristics. Um, so it's really in, uh, understand to, it's, it's really important to understand that, um, you know, so that we can counteract it uh, at the workplace. So now how does bias affect us? Uh, what's important to understand is we don't see and hear the world the way we think we do. Our brain is interpreting and influencing our view of the world. Again, that fast brain is, is trying to very quickly assess situations and, and keep us out of danger. So we each have a filter through which we see and, and hear the world. And everyone's filter is different because of our background, because of our experience, education, you know, where we grew up, our family, you know, everything else that makes us who we are. And, and again, it's safer for the brain to keep away perceived threats rather than actually distinguish true threats. So our fast brain just wants to say, you know, I doubt this and I want to keep that away because it's danger. And it's our slow brain that says, wait a minute, you know, this this person, this situation, maybe it's not all that bad. I need to I need to dig into this more and figure out what's going on. 
Um, so again, it's this, it's this tug of war between the fast and the slow brain. And Ross says, we don't think the way we think we think. Um, and I, and I want to I wanna show an example of this. Clearly, somebody in this room Oops. murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, I think. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So the, the point of that video was to understand we're all exposed to 11 million pieces of information at any one time, but we can only absorb about 50. So if you notice during that video, you know, the, the camera zoomed in and was very restrictive. It went around the room, you know, went around people and, and asked them where they were, you know, at, at the time of apparently the murder. And a lot of stuff was being changed underneath outside of the camera's view. So then at the end, when they panned back out, there were a lot of things that changed, apparently 21 changes. So the question is, how much of that did you notice? The, the point is, we all have selective attention. We pay attention to what we're oriented to pay attention to. So two people can go through the same experience, interpret it differently. So for example, you know, in the workplace, two people can go to a meeting and walk out with, with very different impressions. You know, if there are a lot of people in the meeting, if there's a lot of things going on, if different people are reacting, you know, body language is different, you know, subtle things are different and, and people can have different impressions because of that. So, and, and we're all gonna pay attention to, to what we want to pay attention to. So literally interpretations can be different. So really the bias is the framework for looking at the world. It's our place, or it's our playbook. It's shortcuts for what's good or bad or dangerous. And, and really the, the point is we have to understand people interpret things differently based on their filters. So I'm gonna show you another example. And I want you all to realize um, Ross used this as an example back in 2016, uh, way well before 2020 and even now when this particular phrase um, you know, it really did start a lot of, of unrest. And I want to use it as an example. I want to I want to walk you through the same way Ross did and show you how different people can interpret one thing in multiple different ways. So here it is. Black Lives Matter. We've we've all seen this. We know, you know, it's it's been in the news and it's and it's the reason for a lot of unrest recently. The challenge is what some people see, what some people interpret, they add onto what's actually in front of them. And they interpret it to mean only Black Lives Matter. And then some other people interpret it differently and they interpret it Black Lives Matter too. The question is, which is it? Well, in reality, the only thing it says is what's in the middle. And it's different people add different things to it. They interpret it differently. And, and we wonder why we're arguing about the same thing. It's our background that causes, to us, causes us to interpret the same information differently. We don't even realize we're seeing different things. We're arguing about two different things, even though we're seeing one thing. What we, we see what we look for and we see what we know. So that's, that's another example. Different people's interpretation alter what really happens or their interpretation of what happened. We don't even realize we're seeing different things or experiencing different things. Again, it's all this multitude of information coming at, it, coming at us. And our fast brain and our slow brain has to try and weed through all that information 
and make sense of it. And we're going to interpret it differently because of that. It takes 20% more brain power to see something positive versus negative because we literally have to filter out the negative before we can see the positive. Again, it's that fast brain trying to keep us safe and so our fast brain is just gonna look for the danger. So it's gonna look for the negative. Our slow brain, we have to engage our slow brain to say, wait a minute, that's actually not negative. It's a good thing. And, and we have to get our slow brain to push that fast brain out of the way. The, the good news is we have the capacity to overcome the fast brain with our conscious part of the brain. That's the slow brain. The, the challenge is we don't always use it when we need to, um, but it's our slow brain that, the, that allows us to be discerning. So I'm going to play another video, and this is a demonstration of fast brain versus slow brain. So as I play the video, try and follow along and follow Ross's instructions. I'm going to, I'm going to play um, one of the uh, lectures that he did. So let's do a little test. We could show how the fast brain and the slow brain work. I'm going to show you a series of letter combinations. And what I'd like you to do is don't worry about what the letters say. All, all I want you to do is to read out loud the color of the font. Okay, so let's try one. Okay, I'm going to go fast. Let's see if you can keep up. That's good. Most of you know. So if you could hear the audience, they, they did pretty well keeping up with the colors. And, and he was, you know, those, those letter combinations were coming up about, you know, two, three seconds apart. So now listen to what happens. Your colors. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, that was pretty easy, right? Let's do it again. It was pretty easy. Pretty easy. Well, it wasn't that hard. Come on, we'll do it again. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. Yeah, what happened that time? Yeah? What happened was you felt the tug of war in your brain, didn't you? A tug of war between your fast and your slow brain. I gave you a very clear slow brain instruction. It was easy the first time. The second time, you gave yourself a fast brain instruction. It's an instruction most of us have been learning since we were three years old. Letter combinations make words. You know, and that same tug of war happens when we encounter somebody we have a stereotype about. Okay, so that was another example of the tug of war that happens between the fast brain and the slow brain. You know, your fast brain is just trying to work so fast. It's harder. It takes longer uh, to get the slow brain to engage. It seems like a very simple thing. You know, why you couldn't just say the name of those colors, but when the actual word in front of you was different than the color itself, your, your brain was just, it had a tug of war and it's very difficult to do. So I'm going to do a, another, um, another example. So if you're at home, um, I, want you to, I want you to actually say this word out loud. If you're somewhere that uh, you can't say it out loud, just say it in your brain. So let's let's go through this this example. But I but I want you all to try and do your best to participate. Okay, so say the word silk. Do it again. Say the word silk. One more time. Say the word silk. Now, what do cows drink? How many people put put your uh, um, raise your hand? How many people? answered to the question, what do cows drink? How many people answered milk? Let's see, and please be honest. Okay, so we have, I don't know how many people we have. I, I probably, I don't know the total, maybe 60 or 80, and we're getting probably at least about maybe 25, getting to 30%, somewhere around there, of people that answered milk. And when I did this too, this was in Ross's uh, video, I did the same thing. I answered milk. And, it, and once he, you know, once he explained, it's like cows drink water. And it was just like, oh my gosh, how in the world did I do that? And, and any other time of the day, if anybody asked you, what do cows drink? He would have said water. But what this demonstrates is priming the brain. It's the power of suggestion. Again, it's that fast brain clicking in. And even though you're slow brain, you, we all know cows drink water, they make milk but that's the power of suggestion. So again, the, the, the important point there is, is the power of suggestion, priming the brain. Um, and, it, and it's just another example of how the fast brain can work. So uh, also we need to understand that, that biases influence how positive, neutral, or negative you can feel about someone. You can support someone with micro behaviors and you can also hurt someone with microaggressions. And Howard gives uh, an example of meeting somebody as an adult with a blue sweater on and you know he just he just feels uneasy uneasy 
And maybe it's because somebody with a blue sweater back when he was in grade school embarrassed him. But if, if we don't know that, our fast brain is telling us, oh, blue sweater equals danger. You know, maybe not necessarily embarrassment, but still danger, right? And it takes our slow brain to say, wait a minute, I've never met this person. Why am I feeling uneasy about them? You know, and so again, it's that, it's that fast brain response. Um, and again, you know, Howard said, biases relate to every aspect of, of life and people. Again, he can cite a study for almost any human characteristic and show that we can be biased. Um, and and he, he said, this is one of, the, one of the things I find just really intriguing. Uh, he states, we make up things about people all the time. We literally just make them up in our head. Um, and it's important to understand why and, and how we need to counteract that. And the question again is, not do we have bias? We all are truly biased. The question is, what, out, what are our biases? So one of the ways we can learn more about our biases is take an implicit association test. And this is a website and you've got the link. Um, it's put on by Harvard and a couple other um, universities. And what it does is it measures the strength of associations, evaluations, or stereotypes. And really the purpose is to educate about implicit bias. And again, if, if, if we don't know how we're biased, then how can we possibly you know, work to overcome that. So really the, the goal is to raise awareness and encourage self-reflection. And back in 2014, I took the, the test. This, I took the gender science IAT and it says this IAT often reveals a relative link between liberal arts and females and between science and males. Well, I'm a woman in science. So I figured I can't possibly, possibly be biased against myself, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this test and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ace it. I'm going to do great. I'm going to show that I'm not biased in that way. Well, guess what? My results said, your data suggests a strong association of male with science and female with liberal arts compared to the opposite. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm a woman in science. How can I be biased against myself? And actually, at the time, I was, I was pretty ashamed. I felt guilty. I was like, how can I be biased? You know, I, I, I can't possibly be biased against myself. And, you know, since then, I've come to understand we all are biased and we need to accept that. We need to get past the guilt and work to counteract it. So we all truly are biased. I encourage you to, to go to this website and, and, you know, take a variety of the tests. Um, if you're, you know, if you're lucky and, and unlike me, you, you won't have the bias with uh, gender and science. Um, and, and that's a good thing <laughs> since most of the people here might be in science. Okay, so a lot, a lot of other biases um, that, that can affect, especially the workplace. There's a halo and horns. This is basically shorthand for positive or negative first impressions. Basically, the idea is if, if you have a good first impression and you have a halo over your head and there's nothing you can do wrong. If you have a bad first impression and you have horns and there's nothing you can do right. Um, there's an affinity bias and this is favoring people who share the same social background. And, and that's really important because we, we will tend to, towards uh, people who look and sound like one of us. We ignore the faults of people we like and notice the faults of those we don't. And this demonstrates why diversity is so important. There's also a social comparison bias, stereotype threat. Um, as a scientist, one of the ones I find um, concerning and I, and I doubt how I've looked at data in the past, there's a confirmation bias. Noticing or looking only for evidence which confirms our ideas, good or bad. Again, as a scientist, there's several times I've had to look at a, at a body of data and come up with a conceptual model. And have I really evaluated all of the data equally? Um, and, and it's something I, I try and think about now, you know, something I think is an outlier. Is it really an outlier or is it just that it doesn't fit my conceptual model? Um, outcome bias. This is a tendency to evaluate a decision on the basis of its outcome rather than on what factors led to the decision. Um, it's also weighting a past outcome heavier than other information and in making a same, similar decision. So in other words, if you had a positive outcome before, you may not necessarily reevaluate that, that decision and, and actually, you know, basically, re, you know, make a different decision. And a really tragic um, example of this is the Columbia accident. Um, in the past, falling foam had occurred on previous launches, but uh, only caused usually minor damage. And in that case, it, it caused the loss of that entire crew. So part of what led to that, and this is actually based on the NASA um, reports, part of the, what led to that was outcome bias. So that's a really tragic example. So how do we take, uh, how do we counteract our own biases? First, take responsibility for ourselves and how we act. 
And like Ross says, let go of the guilt. I mean, just get past it. We can't beat ourselves over their head. We're all biased. It's based on our on our experience, on our background, on our upbringing. You know, you're 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 not really going to get past it. But what's important is to acknowledge it and understand how to get how to um, over overcome it. Become an observer of how fear impacts you. What are you afraid of? What are your fears? So if you you know if you meet somebody or if you you know walk into a room and you're all of a sudden uneasy, it's like wait a minute, what's going on? Why? You know, I've just met this person. Why do I have a bad first impression? You know, at the start of the meeting, why am I feeling uneasy? You know, it may trace back to something in your past. And it may be that fast brain working, working behind the scenes and, and trying to tell you, oh, there's danger. And in reality, it's, you know, it's something you can manage if you let your slow brain engage. So, you know, to that point, acknowledge a bias, let the slow brain engage. We can't change anything until we accept it. If we don't take the first step of acknowledging and understanding our biases, we have no hope of overcoming them. So, you know, get the slow brain to engage, acknowledge a bias. So two things that Ross suggests for getting that slow brain to work is meditation and breathing. And so what he suggests is, you know, maybe before a big meeting or before you go into an interview or before you have to review a report and make some decisions or just before, you know, anything that has consequences in, in, in the business world, you know, maybe practice meditation or do some breathing exercises because that will engage the slow brain. And it'll try and help counteract that fast brain from just firing too much and over influencing our decisions. Embrace and explore fear. And again, that's that that fast brain trying to keep us away from danger. You know, what's making us uneasy or fearful or, you know, just a host of other emotions. So so dig into that and, and see if there's really something on underlying a particular situation. Um, and Ross says, freedom is the pause between stimulus and response. So he suggests count to 10 before reacting or responding, let the slow brain engage. Again, just try and quash that fast brain response, get the slow brain to overcome. And, and then, you know, that's one of the best ways we can try and make sure that we're not responding, you know, to our biases from our fast brain. Also engage and learn from others, you know, people that don't look like us or don't think the same way uh, we do. Um, surround yourself with others, you know, and in my case, I'm a scientist, maybe, you know, maybe I need to go, um, you know, understand more from somebody that's more on the on the liberal arts side, um, you know, in, in my job. Um, don't try to change the reality of others, rather understand them. Um, you know, they have they, their history, you have yours. Um, what's more important is to understand their perspective. Um, be, an be an ally um, towards, uh, for, for people that don't look like you. Explore awkwardness and discomfort. Again, it's, it's, it's kind of that fear side. You know, if your fast brain is, is making you feel awkward and, and uncomfortable, then, you know, get at the, the root of the problem. Understand everyone needs to belong. You know, we all want to belong to, belong to groups. And so, um, you know, inviting others in is the way to make sure that happens. Learn to question and dis or just trust your first impression. Again, your first impression is going to be your fast brain response. So if we learn to question that, um, you know, at least at a minimum question it, or in some cases just flat out distrust it, um, then, then you can overcome that, that fast brain response. Be curious and embrace differences in thought and appearance. Um, challenge negative assumptions and stereotypes. Don't try to suppress bias. Understand it. You're not, it's, you're not going to change it. Um, but the best thing you can do is, is understand it. Ross actually gave an example. Um, I mean, he's an expert in, in understanding bias and uh, diversity and inclusion. And like I said, organizational transformation. He's an expert in the field. And he gave an example recently um, of where he still was biased in a particular situation. So here's an expert and he still, you know, didn't get past the bias. So, you know, don't think that us non-experts are going to be able to, to, to get past it. Um, so, so don't try and suppress it. Just the best thing to do is understand it, acknowledge it, and then take steps to counteract. So um, also be careful about our echo chamber. Um, that's that. It, it's part of that confirmation bias, you know, reduce the, reduce the confirmation. So if, if we have, you know, friends or colleagues or family who feel the same way we do, maybe we need to reach out and, and look for a different perspective. Develop greater consciousness about yourself. Um, turn inward. You know, if, if you're making a decision, if you're questioning something, maybe ask, why do I make these decisions? Why do I feel the way I do? What is triggered? You know, again, is it is it that blue sweater example from the past? You know, what what's being triggered here? 
Um, and Ross says, if you're hysterical, it's often historical. Not that a lot of times in business we're going to be hysterical, but what, what he was getting at is if you're having some sort of emotional response to something where otherwise it wouldn't really make sense. If you're feel fearful of some, somebody, if you're angry, um, you know, some other emotion, then maybe it's something in your past that's triggering that. And it's your fast brain. So, you know, stop, think about that and, and try and get the, the slow brain um, to engage. Um, and to understand other people's uh, perspectives, um, he suggests you can take the other to lunch. Again, somebody that maybe um, doesn't look like you, literally different gender, different race, you know, all of those other aspects, um, appearance, or somebody that just simply doesn't think the way you, uh, the, the same way you do. Um, and agree on some ground rules. You know, the goal is not to persuade, defend, or interrupt. Um, really, you want to understand the other person's perspective. Um, so be curious, authentic, and listen. And then ask four questions. What are some of your life experiences that have led you to feel the way you do? Um, what issues deeply concern you? What have you always wanted to ask from someone from the other side? Is there anything you would like to say to clean up the past? The purpose is to um, is not to convince, but to understand. Again, understand a different perspective or understand, um, you know, just a, a different a different way of looking at the same thing. So if you're if you're having a, a difficult time making a decision and you're questioning your decision, ask a colleague to evaluate, you know, maybe a, a colleague or a friend or a family member. Um, you know, it, it's it, a lot of times can be really helpful to look out um, and, and get others opinions. And also ask yourself, is my opinion factually true? Is it always true? And what evidence do I have? Um, again, these might be for, for decisions that you're making in the workplace that, you know, just may not make a lot of sense. So you can always question and just say, look, if, am, am I really on the right path here? Or am I letting bias, um, you know, take a little bit too much control and, and influence my decisions? So if we see biases with other people, um, how do we counteract that? Well, the first step is be authentic about your own biases. Share your own biases and be and be truthful. Admit, you know, yeah, I'm a woman in science, but guess what? I still, I guess, have a bias to associate men with science and, and women with uh, liberal arts. So I have to be aware of that. Um, and I and I shouldn't be ashamed. I shouldn't be guilty. I need to share that with others around me and say that's something I have to I have to try and counteract. Um, acknowledge the feelings of others. Um, and maybe one an example he gives is um, I understand you believe a single mother will not fit this role. Um, you know, if you're if you're facing a challenge with with management, obviously this is this might be somebody that, that thinks a little differently than you do. Um, and you can open up a conversation and say, you know, why is it that you think this won't work? Um, you can clarify and avoid assumptions and say, am I missing something? Because I'm still not clear as to how this happened. You know, how did we get here? Um, what's the path that led here? And and you know, is that path maybe it needs to be altered? Um, you can explore and and look for evidence. Um, and you can op maybe open a conversation by saying, "Help me understand what you meant." Um, and you can also uh, try and uh, provide solutions. You know, problem solving and in a way to move forward. So maybe start a conversation or, or within a conversation say, "What would a better situation look like for you?" Um, so these are all, you know, things you can try and keep in mind if you, if you, um, you know, come upon someone who's who's biased um, in the workplace. So so these are are good suggestions for actions you can take. And then also, most importantly, take action for micro behaviors and beyond. So if you see somebody, um, you know, not not behaving in a in an appropriate manner in the workplace, it's important to say something. If we don't say something, um, then we can never expect it to get better. So this starts literally at the micro behavior um, level and to, you know, further actions up above. You know, for example, back to the single mother will not fit this role. You know, if, if you're looking, you know, in a hiring decision or something like that and you see somebody maybe biased against you know, just somebody for, for a situation you don't think is, is right, then you've got to say something. So one other um, thing we can all do, um, especially in meetings, is create inclusive meetings. Um, set time to accommodate caregivers, different time zones, religious obligations, international holidays. Um, greet everyone warmly. This is one of the micro behaviors or microaggressions even that, that is used as an example. Um, you know, a, a leader might walk into a room and greet warmly the people that they know and just gonna kind of give that, oh, passing hey to the people that they don't know. 
um, greet everyone warmly. Everyone, it brings everyone in and it includes them in the meeting and lets them know that, that you know, they can speak up and, and express their opinions. Value others' time as much as you value your own. Um, so, you know, put the phone down, you know, don't be, um, you know, be, be at the meeting when you're there. Um, don't be distracted. Don't always sit in, sit next to the same person. So again, like actually take meetings as as an opportunity to sit next to somebody that you don't necessarily know as well. Um, limit interruptions, be present, pay attention, rotate responsibilities, you know, and that includes note taking, preparation, clean up, bringing supplies, you know, arranging the meeting in the first place, the, the follow up, the action items, things like that. Respond constructively to something you disagree with. Um, you know, again, embrace and explore you know, thoughts that are different to your own. So, you know, try not to just squash different ideas, you know, try and, and bring it out. Um, you know, diversity, uh, it's been shown. Uh, I mean, we all know diversity um, leads to better business. Solicit the opinion of everyone in the room, even the quiet ones, you know, so there might be might be some quiet folks and they're just too shy to speak up, but when called on, maybe, maybe those quiet folks might have a good idea. Um, so really solicit ideas. If if not everybody is speaking up, then you're not taking advantage of the true diversity that's present in a meeting. Um, be open to challenges and opin opinions from everyone. Um, and ideas are attributed to the originator. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, that was great. Those examples that you discussed are really pretty eye opening. So. Um, yeah. We're going to go ahead and start the question and answer session. I'll go ahead and read a question. Do you have any examples of a situation where you have called on someone for their bias and how did you approach it or respond? Yeah, I, I mean, I've I've definitely had some. I'll say somebody make a comment about. Whether he wanted a woman in a position because that position expected a lot of field work and um you know i i had to just shut that person down and say look you need to give everybody the same opportunities and you can't think that just because she's a woman she's i mean literally the comment was she's you know going to go off and have a family and we're not going to be able to send her out in the field um and it turned out fortunately um that person was was proven incredibly wrong because that person was stellar out in the field. And yes, she had to take some time off to start her family, um, but you know she did great in the field. She did great in the group. In, in the group. Um, and so yeah, I've 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 been in uncomfortable situations, and it's it's tough. But you've got to say something, otherwise you 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 know it's you can't expect anything to get better. Um, we've we've got to be comfortable and at least acknowledging and saying we have to give everybody a fair shake and and not make assumptions about you know anybody okay thank you for that um i have a question that that's actually uh, sort of similar but you mentioned several ways to you know counteract bias so i was just curious if there's any particular tactic that you found personally uh, to be one of the most successful for counteracting bias in the workplace or maybe what is a tactic that you've seen others use that seems to have proven uh, beneficial or successful in the workplace? I think I think for me, the the one I've used the most is is I, I think the the thing was help me understand help me understand that you know because if somebody says something that shocks you, your my knee jerk reaction is is anger and so I have to you know I have to quell that, um, but. The way to get past it, the, the way and try and not, you know, not let that anger surface, you know, get rid of the emotion is, wait a minute, you you just, I think you just said this, you know, help me understand how you, you know, why you said that statement, how you got to that conclusion, you know, why are you making that association, you know, whatever it is. Um, so it's, and once you ask the person to explain whether they're going to realize, okay, I just made an association I shouldn't have, you know, then you're at least on equal ground because you, you're giving the person an opportunity to sit there and say, wait a minute, as I'm thinking about this, maybe that wasn't the, the right thing to say or the, or the right assumption to make, you know what I mean? So asking them just to explain more might allow them to reflect and realize um, they need to change their, change their behavior, change a decision, change their attitude, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. 
Great, thank you. I will ask one that just touches on if you can discuss anything about this recent age bias that's rampant in employment now and sort of how to apply this to the conversation and, and what's going on uh, with that particular bias right now. Yeah, I, I guess I don't know. I'm not aware of of what particular age bias there is right now, but I, I know a, a former colleague actually mentioned that in an interview, um, he was asked how old he was. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. That one that's, at least in the US, that's actually, I don't think a legal question that you can ask. Um, but two, fortunately, he had the presence of mind to respond and say, you know, that really shouldn't influence your decision as to whether I'm appropriate for this job or not. Um, you know, the question we need to, we need to get back to experience. And, you know, his, his impression was the person was worried that he was going to retire too soon. And, you know, that's, that's ageism right there. Um, so, like I said, fortunately, he was, he was able to, to alter the conversation and talk about his, his experience and, you know, how good he was going to be at the job, um, you know, things like that. So do you, do you think it's possible then to counteract bias at the, you know, organizational level through workshops or trainings, or does this require more of like an individualistic approach with everybody being so unique and different in their bias or both? I think it's both. Um, and in fact, um, Ross provides lectures to companies, to organizations. I mean, a lot of what's online, um, there's a, there's one online where he was given a lecture to Google. Um, and, and I actually had the opportunity to see him, um, you know, at a, at a company function um, where I was previously. So, you know, that's something Ross does and it's something other professionals do. Um, so there are, there are ways you can reach out to folks, um, and, you know, and, and understand more about bias. Um, so I think it's, I think it's probably going to happen on, on multiple level, levels. It needs to be supported by the corporation. And then each of us as individuals, you know, literally need to, need to want to take on the challenge of understanding our bias and then taking the steps to, to counteract it. Okay, thank you. And Delaney, I see uh, Deborah's question here about asking, do you have specific examples of how it might be different in private consulting versus government agencies and public sector jobs? So Kelly, I don't know if you can talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have specific examples. I've worked mostly, um, you know, in, in consulting. I mean, in, the initial four years of my career was in a government job. Um, I mean, regulations are, you know, they're a little bit more strict in, in public and governmental jobs, but I think ultimately, you know, our goal needs to be the same and, and that we all need to improve. Um, diversity certainly could improve um, across all sectors, and not only companies, but um, government and public jobs as well. But I mean, I don't have any specific examples. Great, thank you. And I, I did have a question. This is Leela. Um, yeah, my question was just um, about challenging others. It's is that just your perception is that you then help them to engage their slow brain? And if I understood that correctly. Yeah, I mean, in, engage their slow brain and also just reflect on on what it was they said. I mean, it you know if. If somebody just makes a, a, a comment, it might have been their their fast brain, and if they were given a chance to reflect, maybe they they realize, oh wait a minute, I you know, I shouldn't have said that. Or even if they truly do feel that, then maybe it's an attitude um, that truly does need to be changed. So it's you know it's one of the two. But at least by by asking them to explain, it's you know it's not the confrontational, you know wait a minute, why did you, you know, what did you just say? I don't agree with that. You know, it's at least I've found that it's a non-confrontational way um, to start a conversation and and get to understand more about why the person feels that way and understand, is there just a different perspective? I mean, is this bias or, um, you know, has this person had uh, maybe a past bad experience that they're, they really don't want to, um, you know, try somebody out with, a particular, um, you know, experience level or something like that. Um, you know, it, it just depends on the situation. Absolutely. Thank you. A participant has um, asked, so they read um, a paper years ago that people will adapt their behavior on the fly. 
and shift towards, you know, people they respect or want to model themselves after. So should we avoid this and how? Because this seems like it is a fast bring response. It, it is. In fact, it's like that affinity bias. I, I mean, I don't know. I guess I guess it depends on the situation. I mean, I I I personally always try and be, you know, rigorously independent. Um, but that's just me. Um, you know, I I but at the same time I can also you know, I know that certain aspects of of the way I act um, do change because, um, in fact, uh, a group of friends of mine, they can tell when I go home and I'll come back with a southern drawl. Um, you know, just being home for a week, just hearing it. Um, I, I My family's in Virginia and I live in Colorado. Um, and usually in Colorado, I don't think I have a southern drawl. So it's it's just kind of in, in some of our behaviors, it's, you know, I pick it up. So it's just kind of natural. Um, but you know, that, that sense of all of us wanting to belong, if, you know, if picking up behaviors of the group that you want to belong to, as long as you don't lose yourself in it, maybe it's, maybe it's not the, the worst thing in the world, but what's really important is, you know, we, we, I, I really truly believe that in business, we have to value our diversity. So you can't suppress what makes you truly you, you know, so, you know, in business, one of the things I've, I've heard people say is, you know, again, pointing to those quiet people, you know, if you don't pull out the quiet ones, you're not tapping into the true diversity of your group. Or if, you know, kind of similar to that, if a person is trying to mimic somebody else, it's that affinity bias, then they're suppressing their own true ideas. Um, so I guess there has to be a balance between, you know, letting your true self come out. Um, but then maybe also, yeah, you're just going to pick up some things. Um, you know, if you're immo immersed um, in a group that's that's different than you. Okay, thank you. That's great. Here's another really good question. If someone's uh, biases are interfering uh, with their ability to effectively lead or work with others, and they're not receptive to training their brain to think differently, how do you kind of handle that and go about that? Yeah, I, I guess... I've definitely run into that and that's that's you know it's it's different for each situation i mean in that case i would reach out to management um and you know that's where you're going to need to have evidence and you know demonstrate clearly it's like look i'm you know concerned about decisions or you know promotions and you know or how people are treated um and you just may need to to bring in help or if you have a a good enough relationship with the person you know, maybe you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person and then use some of the, you know, some of those examples of, of how to start a conversation um, and, you know, get that, understand more of that person's perspective. Um, if they truly are, um, you know, just not understanding or, or it's just, you know, the way, the way they expect business to be different, um, you know, so first gather information and then, and then see if there's something simple you can do. Um, to, to modify that person's behavior or whether you have to bring in, um, you know, management help. All right. Thank you. I think we have time for uh, just one more question. Could you speak to potential biases that present themselves as a group? So sort of like group bias and you're an individual that sees the group as a whole um, presenting bias? How do you sort of approach that group? Um, I've definitely been in a group situation where I'm only in multiple cases or I'm only I'm the only one to speak up. Um, and it's difficult. Um, and, you know, but again, if you don't say anything, um, things aren't going to get better. I mean, I guess it just depends on the situation. Um, I mean, at the time I was in a leadership position and, you know, I was in a group of, of similar leaders and <laughs> every single person in the room um, was a man and I was the only woman. And, you know, there was just a tendency to to think, um, you know, differently. And, and I spoke up. Um, don't get me wrong. It was very difficult. Um, so it just depends on the situation. Um, there have been, and then there have been other times where, you know, I found out about information later and then talked to people individually later and say, hey, you remember, remember when this happened in this meeting? Um, you know, this, this person, 
you know, or, or a situation, you know, maybe we should have, you know, considered this. Um, so maybe there's individual conversations you can have, um, you know, afterwards and, and follow up. Um, and I mean, in a group situation, you know, it, obviously it can be, it can be difficult, but again, if, if you don't say anything at all, um, you know, it, it's not going to get better. We've, we've got to, you know, we've got to raise awareness, um, because, you know, otherwise just, we, we can't expect things to get better if we keep, if we keep going along, you know, the same way we've always been, uh, acting. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, well, that's about all uh, we have time for today. So thank you everyone for the excellent questions and thank you, Kelly, for presenting today. If you have any questions that were not addressed today, you can email them to us at goalie at americangeosciences.org and we'll make sure to send your questions along to Kelly. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much, Kelly, for sharing your time, expertise, and insights with us. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks everyone.